as opposed to not really your own, um, in the wrong place. The concept of a person, I'm going to argue, is an essentially evaluative concept. Um, and uh, for Frankfurt, of course, this distinction between aspects of your behavior that are truly your own and aspects that are not truly your own, this distinction between behavior that is free and unfree, I'm not sure about that, but I do think that it's going to be very closely related to helping us understand what it is for behavior to be autonomous. Because you're autonomous when you are self-governed. And if the governance uh, is really yourself, that's when you're going to be autonomous. But if the governance is not truly yourself, then you won't really be autonomous. And so I think that knowing which of your behavior is truly your own is going to be really closely connected to autonomy. And hence, it's going to be a consequence of my thesis that autonomy itself is not a psychological condition. Rather, it is in part an evaluative or normative condition. All right. So uh, the talk is going to divide up into two parts. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to lay out a little bit of the view and the central motivation that I'm going to focus on for purposes of this talk. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to go on to draw out three important consequences. Now, I don't take these three consequences to just be corollaries. In fact, I take it, each of these consequences to be fruitful enough in its own right to contribute to the cumulative case that this evaluative view of persons is on the right track. However, I'm going to frame it for purposes of this talk as a kind of motivation and then a kind of consequences. And if, uh, we're going to start by talking more about the concept of person and how it's related to what philosophers sometimes call attributability, the idea that some of your behavior belongs to you in a way that other behavior doesn't. Second, I'm going to argue that as philosophers, we need an account of attributability and hence of persons that is holistic in nature. Rather than locating certain parts of your psychology as the parts in which your true self is seated, rather we need to look at all of you and all of your behavior over and your thoughts over time and find the best account holistically of which aspects of you and your behavior and your thoughts and your ideas are je represent generally you and which parts do not. And uh, then I'm going to use that as the key of my argument for what I call evaluatism about persons. It's because we need a holistic account and because evaluatism offers the best prospects for an account that is holistic and second that's holistic in the right ways, getting certain kinds of key cases right, that we should be evaluatists about persons. Then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to draw out my three consequences. The first of these consequences concerns the distinctive human capacity that we have to treat one another in dehumanizing ways. The second uh, is to draw out the consequences of evaluatives about what persons for a distinctive kind of interpersonal conflict that I call discord. And discord is important both because it involves our capacity to treat each other in dehumanizing, or as I prefer to say, depersonalizing ways, ways that bring each other down, that objectify each other, that treat each other as less than fully uh, persons in certain respects. But second, Discord is something that can happen and can persist even between well-meaning people. It includes kinds of conflicts that can persist between spouses, between siblings, between parents and children over time, and that they can have trouble getting over. And we all have conflicts in our relationships that we have trouble getting over. And the reason that evaluatism about persons is going to tell us something about discord is that evaluatism about persons is going to lend itself to an explanation of not only of the possibility but of the prevalence of a certain kind of misunderstanding that can happen between people. And in particular, of how that misunderstanding can be mutual, how it is that both parties can misunderstand each other in systematic ways. And then finally, since one of the important kinds of misunderstanding that's predicted by evaluatives in between persons uh, is illuminating classified as a kind of silencing. It's the kind of silencing that Mary Kate McGowan has characterized as what she calls type four silencing. I'm going to close the talk by drawing out some consequences uh, of evaluating the persons as I understand it for the empirical plausibility of the claim that some groups of persons, particularly persons belonging to disadvantaged or oppressed groups, and I'll just focus on the case of women for the case of this talk, are systematically silenced. So without further ado, let's get down to it, persons and attributability. So Frankfurt, in freedom of the will and the concept of the person introduced us to this idea that some aspects of somebody's behavior are more truly their own and some aspects are less truly their own by introducing us to the characters of the willing and the unwilling addict. Now the willing and the unwilling addict have a great deal in common. Other parts of their life might be very similar and they both have an overwhelming addiction to a drug. 
In fact, from both cases, their addiction to this drug is so strong that it's inevitable that by the end of the day, they're gonna end up taking the drug. But whereas the unwilling addict wakes up in the morning uh, thinking this is the day that they're gonna get through with the hope and the expectation and the plan today is gonna be their first day sober, the willing addict gets up in the morning and looks forward to getting their first hit. So the unwilling addict, because their addiction is so strong, is not gonna be able to succeed. Eventually, they're bound to succumb and they're gonna take the drug. The willing addict looks forward, plans, gets ready, takes the drug. And Frankfurt suggests that the willing's addict ought to count in some important sense as more truly their own, and the unwilling's addict ought to count as less truly their own. Indeed, I think this is right. I think there's a lot of other cases that could draw out this for us, this, the intuitive plausibility of this claim. The unwilling addict, as Frankfurt describes them, succumbs. They're passive in the face of circumstances that they face. They have this predicament that faces them of this difficult addiction. Whereas for the willing addict, the addiction doesn't feel so much like their predicament. Rather, the addiction looks like it helps to constitute them as a protagonist. It's part of who they are, that they are choose, choosing to take the drug, that they're eager to take it. That's part of who they are. Those are natural descriptions of the case. And so it makes for a natural description of a, an intuitive distinction that some things count as more truly your own and something counts less truly your own. Now, Frankfurt claimed, though he didn't say a lot to explain why, that our that the question of which aspects of your behavior are truly your own and which aspects are less truly your own is gonna flow from our concept of person. And I wanna say a little bit why, a little bit about why I think that is right. And the answer is a very simple argument. It goes like this, you're a person, so behavior traits of you are behavior or traits of a person. And it's gonna follow that behavior or traits of something else that isn't a person are gonna be yours only in a derivative sense. So for example, you might be holding a toddler and I might be holding a toddler and the toddler you're holding is screaming and the toddler that I'm holding is screaming. There's a sense in which the screaming of your toddler is yours in a way that the screaming of my toddler is mine. But it's not yours in the same way that you're screaming. If, for example, you're screaming back at the toddler uh, is yours. Uh, you're screaming belongs to you in a more intimate, direct way than the way that the toddler screaming belongs to them. So in principle, if persons are not the same thing as human bodies, then it's going to be the case that persons can have properties that are not the same as the properties of the human bodies that are the bodies of those persons. So uh, that is what I take this key distinction to be between aspects of your behavior that are more truly your own, aspects of your behavior that are less truly your own, and that's why I take it to be intimately connected to the nature of persons. The things that are more truly your own are the things that are properties of you directly. So since you're a person, they're properties of you. Uh, whereas lots of properties of your body may, in principle, not be properties of you directly. They might be properties that are only associated with you because they're properties of your body. So they're very intimately connected with you in a way that the screaming of the toddler is more connected with you than the screaming of my toddler. But they're not properties of you in the first instance. In that sense, it makes sense to say that they're less truly your own. Now this, I think, is a very tight connection between the concepts of person and attributability. The connection is so close that if I was prone to use words like this, I would say that it's analytic or conceptual. There's a close connection between the nature of persons and attributability. And that makes it makes sense to think that our concept, our answer to what things are attributable to you is going to flow from our kind of persons. But in fact, I'm going to take things the other way around. I'm going to argue that we'll get insight into what it is to be a person from seeing which kinds of things are attributable to you and how to get the best account of that. So I think that Frankfurt's right to think it's got to be closely connected to our concept of person and that's be a helpful constraint. Nevertheless, I'm not going to argue first for an account of persons and then for an account of attributability. I'm going to focus on what it is for something to be attributable to you. Now, Frankfurt talks about these things being more truly your own and that has led many philosophers to worry that there's something, talk about this deep, true self or deep self is objectionably metaphysical. And I think that's wrong. As we've seen, uh, this connection between uh, persons and attributability is really tight. And so that it's, I think, gonna be very trivial that these, this vocabulary is gonna make sense. The interesting question is gonna be what persons are and whether persons are distinct from human bodies. If, for example, being a person is the same thing as being a human organism, then the boundary between a person and what's not the person is gonna be the same as the boundary of your physical body. 
And so behavior of your body will all count as you in a strict sense and behavior that's outside of your body, for example, behavior of the toddler that you're holding will count as not you. It'll turn out that all this vocabulary makes sense. It'll simply turn out on this view that Frankfurt's unwilling addict, their behavior really does count as fully their own in the same sense as the willing addicts counts as fully their own. So in this sense, I think that the distinction and all the vocabulary and everything so far is not deep, but rather it is shallow. But in order to make progress with this distinction, to just say something interesting with it, it is gonna to have to turn out that this distinction between what's truly you, who you are as a person, is carved more narrowly. That there's some aspects of you or of your body or your behavior that aren't part of you as a person, but are only part of your body. Um, and in that respect, uh, what Frankfurt needs is very similar to what uh, Peter Strasser needs uh, in freedom of resentment. When he characterizes excuses in terms of the gloss that you are not fully yourself or you weren't being yourself at some time. When Strassing characterizes uh, excuses using this very natural intuitive way of talking that you're excused because you weren't really yourself, what Strassing needs is a temporal distinction mm -hmm. across times between when you're fully yourself and when you're not. Whereas what Frankfurt needs is not a distinction across times, but a distinction between different aspects of your behavior, perhaps at the same time of, of who you are, of what counts as you and what doesn't count as you. Some things are going to count as you and some things won't, even at the same time, because of course the unwilling addict could make a choice between grapefruit juice and orange juice at the very same time that they're taking their hit. So on this picture, what we need is there'd be, there's all this stuff going on inside of you. And among the stuff that's going on inside of you, uh, we need to distinguish which sources or which of the stuff that's going on inside of you is the stuff that is truly your own. And for Frankfurt, in his original article, <laughs> sorry, sorry, the awnings are being removed right outside my window. It's making a little bit of noise. So, so uh, Frankfurt, his original article, uh, uh, says that the part of your behavior that makes something truly your own is your will. And he's got a particularly detailed account that most people remember much better than these broad strokes of the picture that I'm focusing on. And for Frankfurt, it's not that you as a person are identical to your will. Rather, Frankfurt says that being a person is being a creature whose behavior is determined in accordance with your will. But there's still a very close connection between the will and what makes something your behavior. It's almost as if you are the will. And because you are the will, things that the will causes are yours. And things that are not caused by the will are not yours. So it's very close to this picture on which you are something within you. Uh, the kind of thing that Daniel Dennett would call a sort of homuncular picture of the self. And I think that when we see that, uh, that when we characterize it this way, when we, we front the idea that uh, because the will is the, the cause of the things that make something distinctly yours, that makes sense because it's as if the will really is the person, is you. And everything else going on in your body is not you. It's just the, the predicament that you, the protagonist, as the will face. Um, uh, that's what makes it the case that some things, some of your behavior and some of your traits are yours and some of your behavior and some of your traits are not fully yours or not yours in the same sense. And when we characterize Frankfurt's view in this way and characterize lots of other views about attributability or attributed responsibility in the same way as looking for what the source is or where in your psychology is the source of things that are fully yours, whether it's in your will, it's in desires, it's in your values, it's in your moral judgments, it's in your, uh, traits that you accept about yourself or, or descriptions of yourself under which you value yourself. All of these are psychological characterizations and all of them from this Denetian perspective look like they're looking for the homunculus, where inside your body you really are. And on that description, we can see why it is that some people might think that Frank first talk about the true self or the deep self feels more objectionable or metaphysical. And this is a gloss that I do reject. I don't think we should understand this way. Instead, we should look for a holistic account, an account that makes sense given all of your behavior and traits of which of the ones are distinctively yours. Now, on the picture that I've been describing, there's some kinds of causal power that's exerted by the part of you that's distinctively you, perhaps your will. Uh, but of course, it can get into trouble. You can be pushing against the door, but the door is a pull. And so what you end up doing is leaning against the door, but that wasn't what you chose. That was something that was imposed on you by the environment. And similarly, 
on a spectrum, there are other causes that can be within you that could overwhelm. And so the ultimate behavior of your body is not you. It's not determined by the will. In contrast, when things go right, the will exerts some causal power and the contrary forces are not able to overcome it. And so your will is successful. I think this is the kind of picture of agency that comes down to us from Plato. It's a kind of working picture that in Frankfurt, it's a picture that I was very comfortable with and took for granted early in my philosophical career. It's a picture that arises in many different places under many different guises. Um, but I want to start to push back against this picture. And it's independent of whether we think of this homunculus as the will in Frankfurtian sense, or whatever psychological place we look inside ourselves to find the source of where it makes us distinct, what makes our traits or behavior distinctly ours and what makes them not distinctively ours. And the ultimate question is that it's very difficult to draw that line. And we can see how difficult it is to draw that line just by seeing how much people have thought over how to draw that line. So the question of whether these other causes are not us, they're a predicament, or instead they really are us, they're part of who we are as a protagonist, I think we can see how hard that is by just like uh, tracing some very briefly some of the brief outlines of how some of those debates have gone. And so one of the things that's important to see is that some kinds of desires or urges look like they're going to be things that don't seem like they're just really us. So I might have an urge to drink uh, sugary soda. It's something that I was exposed to as a child. Uh, and it's not something I can quite get over. Um, but I know it's not good for me. It's not something that I value. It's not something that's important to me. And so, of course, part of what Frankfurt did in his original article was to explain why not all desires count. Um, uh, responding to Frankfurt, Watson argued that, no, it's not, it's not, we're not going to find a certain kind of desires that counts. Uh, because no desire is going to be the one that's distinctively interesting enough in order to count. And so what we're going to need is we're going to need to have appeal to values or judgments. And so some say we have to look at our judgments or things that help to constitute us in some important way and not just add desires or urges. But of course, there are urges and there are urges. Uh, oops, that's a, that's a dummy urge. There are the kinds of cases that are focused on by people who say that part of who con what constitutes you as yourself is not just judgment, but in fact, some of your inclinations or your longings or perhaps urges will focus typically on cases like the case of a young person who has experienced a strong same-sex attraction and yet has grown up in a religious tradition uh, that's highly resistant to this and characterize it as, as evil. And so this young person does not accept this as part of themselves. They see it as an obstacle that they have to overcome. Uh, they deny that this is important to them. And if what makes aspects of you or your behavior or your traits truly you are your judgments about what's right or what's best or who you are, then we have to say that this young person is somebody who, uh, uh, to whom uh, their same-sex attraction is not central to them. It's part of an obstacle that they have to overcome. Now, philosophers who present these kinds of cases typically present this as an intuitive counterexample to such a view, as a case on which part seems intuitively right that such a person is being inauthentic to themselves, that they're not recognizing something that's important about themselves and paying attention to the experiences of people who have passed through that phase and come to see themselves as having been inauthentic and not recognizing who they really were and later coming to see that was who they really were is supportive of this picture where we see that this is a case where some of these desires did help to characterize who they really were. So some desires, look like they don't characterize who you are, some look like they do. And there's a lot of challenge of trying to come up with similar cases that uh, in order to say which ones, uh, to find psychological differences between cases that look very similar in terms of the psychological causes. But I think things get harder. It's not just the case that there are very similar kinds of psychological causes that in some setups look like they don't help to constitute who we are help to make behavior that they cause is nearly our own. In other cases, they do. It's also the case, as we look more closely, that sometimes the very same causes can contribute to some things that are distinctly our own and to some that are not. And this is because the mind is instantiated in a biological system that has lots of interlocking causes. We have hormones and we have neurotransmitters and these play causal roles in lots of different systems. Uh, in the introduction to listening to Prozac, uh, 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 Peter Kramer describes a case that I think is a typical case 
uh, one of his early patients who was on Pro Prozac, one of the very first ones. This is a man who, uh, before he went on Prozac, was very depressed, but he also had some very ha habits that he was very invested in. In Kramer's case, he was very invested in watching pornographic videos on VHS and making his wife watch them with him, even though she didn't like to. And he went on Prozac. Everything was going better. His life was going better. He was no longer depressed. Things were going well. The only problem was he no longer felt stimulated to watch pornography on VHS, uh, although he still made his wife watch it with him to try to stick to it, even though he didn't feel like it, uh, as Kramer describes it. Now, here's somebody who experiences some aspects of his life as being cases in which he's able to become more distinctly himself. He's able to act in normal ways. He's able to get over this depression. On the other hand, he lost something that he thought was important to him. He felt like he wasn't himself, and so he went off of Prozac. Now, whether we judge him as being right, that he wasn't really himself or not, I think what's important about this case is that from his self-conception, uh, 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 this patient saw himself as losing something of himself at the same time as he gained other things that were really himself. And I think that's ubiquitous. I think that not only are there similar causes where we have to classify them one way or the other, but often there's single causes. And this is going to be a real challenge for locating a single uh, causal source in our human psychology of what makes things really us and what think, makes things not truly really us. The same thing goes, I think, when we look outside ourselves. Lots of work on attributive responsibility has looked for what sorts of distinctive causes inside of us make something truly really us. But just as paying more and more attention to uh, neuroscience uh, and neurochemistry uh, is going to help us to see that there are lots of cases in which one and the same cause can contribute both to things that more, are more truly us and can undermine who we tr uh, truly are in various cases. Uh, similarly, paying more attention to situational psychology is going to help us to see that external features are going to interfere uh, in interesting and fruitful ways uh, with how it is that we manifest our behavior. So for example, uh, when you are generous to somebody after finding a coin in a vending machine, uh, or you pass by the person, the bicyclist who's fallen and needs help on your way to give a lecture about the Good Samaritan, all these kinds of cases uh, have been taken by people who have taken situational psychology seriously to put pressure on how much of us there really is, given the way the external effect, effects can help us. And of course, in principle, we might distinguish between external the features of our environment that help us be who we are and features that interfere with us being who we are. But uh, people who've drawn on situational psychology to uh, criticize uh, character have generally thought it's going to be very hard to draw that distinction. We're not going to be able to draw a distinction between things that are genuinely us and things that are not genuinely us. But I think this is the same thing that's hard about drawing distinction within us. Uh, just like it's hard to draw a distinction within us between what contributes to who we really are and what contributes to that doesn't contribute to who we really are, I think it's hard to draw a distinction outside of us between which features our environment contributes to who we really are and which features don't contribute to who we really are. And so having a holistic account, an account that can look at the whole picture and not have to find a distinctive answer, but uh, look at, decide selectively different cases in different ways is a way that we could incorporate both of these insights. So that's my thought about holism. So what about evaluativism? So to get from holism to evaluativism, let's go back to the case of the young person who experiences strong same-sex attraction and yet has grown up in this religious tradition in which uh, that's alienating and it feels wrong and they believe it to be wrong and not something, something that they deeply disavow. To philosophers, to whom this is an obvious counterexample to the idea that we are constituted by our judgments or who, what we accept about ourselves, um, are coming from a particular perspective. We are perhaps uh, coastal elites uh, at universities who value um, the significance of same-sex relationships and being authentic to uh, sexual attraction. Uh, but the very same example, I think, is not likely to convince the elders uh, in the religious organization who have taught this young person to believe as they do. So, uh, I think that once we see that this example is not an uncontroversial counterexample, but rather whether it seems a counterexample or not, this can be filtered by the differences between our perspectives. And once we see that the differences between our perspectives that are so important for filtering that are differences really in our values, how we value the authenticity to uh, uh, the sexual attractions that we feel, uh, that I think reveals that there isn't a simple answer to this. 
that ultimately our answers to what counts and what we feel like, which of these urges we feel like are ones that uh, are authentic and which of these urges are ones that are part of our predicament that we need to overcome, looks like it is tinged in a valued way. Now, in other work, I've argued that it is evaluative in a distinctive way that we're looking to make the best interpretation of people in a way that makes people out to actually literally be better. But I'm not gonna argue for that today. I'm just gonna argue for the claim that we want the best in that the answer to which aspects of your behavior are genuinely you uh, is evaluative in the sense that it's a question of what leads to the best interpretation of you as a whole. And to get our way into that, I just wanna take one step backward. In looking for which features of you are genuinely you, which features of you are not genuinely you. We're looking for something that ultimately must be determined in some way by what's going on around you. It somehow supervenes on stuff about you and stuff about your nearby environment. So theorists who've been looking for what is truly you by looking for distinctive kinds of psychological causes have been asking that question in a way that's highly constrained. There's just because we know that something about you and your environment makes it the case that some things are truly you and some things are not truly you. It doesn't follow that we know that that is gonna be located in some particular place in your psychology. So it would help take a step backward and say, well, from the whole basis of everything about you, how does that make it the case that some things about you are truly you and some things are not? And this is exactly analogous to the question that David Lewis asks in Radical Interpretation. Rather than asking, well, then specifically uh, what is known about psychology, and asking how it is that those specific features of psychology are ones that are gonna ground the case that people have beliefs and desires with particular contents, Lewis says, let's step back. We know, we don't know a priori that is determined by those things. What we know a priori is that it's determined by all the stuff going on in this area. And now, instead of imposing these really high, heavy a priori constraints, what we should start is by building up constraints in a fruitful way, starting from, check it, our concept of, Lewis says, a person. We start by how we, what we know about how persons work. And that's gonna give us our constraints about how this is gonna work. And I wanna suggest exactly the same thing. In fact, what I'm gonna suggest is totally compatible with what Lewis says, because Lewis allows in his article that there's room for further constraints that come from other things that he hasn't taken into account. So in the kind of interpretation that we're doing, when we interpret whether somebody is, what is attributable to somebody as being genuinely theirs, and what's only a feature of their body, that's not interpretation of the contents of their attitudes, as Lewis is interested in but it is a particular kind of interpretation. And as I've been suggesting tenuously throughout, I think it's a kind of narrative interpretation. What makes this something really yours is that it helps to constitute who you are as a protagonist. And what makes something a feature of your body that is that like the addicts, the unwilling addicts addiction, is a feature of your predicament. It's something that you must overcome or that you are blessed with as a, something that you have to deal with in your life. And so, uh, what we're interested in is a kind of narrative distinction. And so here I'm going to turn to Hilda Lindemann, whose work on narrative stories is particularly helpful and illuminating. Lindemann distinguishes between stories and chronicles, and whereas a chronicle includes all the events, a story works by exclusion. It's important how stories work that they don't include all the things that happen as the Book of Chronicles does in the Old Testament. Or rather, they rule stuff out in order to create a narrative fabric out of what's left. And so if the key distinction between what's truly you and what isn't is really a distinction between who, what constitutes you as a protagonist and what feature is part of your predicament, then what we're doing interpreting each other is we're telling stories. Uh, we're excluding some stuff. It's being stuff that doesn't contribute in the right way or contributes in a competing way to what makes you who you are. And so my thesis is that the beliefs, attitudes, and acts that are attributable to you, the ones that are yours in the first instance, are the ones that are granted by the best personal interpretation of you, the best story about what makes you who you are. That's the thesis. Now, I haven't proven that. Obviously, there's a lot of logical space in the range of holistic views and also in the range of value views. But the answer, it's also very simple in this space. It's simple because 
I'm saying, ultimately, we just have some distinction between stuff that constitutes you and stuff that doesn't. And the answer is, well, what is it? It's the best answer to what that is. That's the sense in which it's holistic. We can look at all of it and we just put stuff in the inbox and we put stuff in the outbox. And the best interpretation is the one that does the most with the stuff that's in the inbox. I haven't told you what makes you do the most. There could be different competing accounts of how that works. Uh, but in a way, that is part of why this is a sort of, uh, sort of, in some sense, a sort of minimal response. And why is that true? I say because to be a person just is to be the best personal interpretation of something, the best story that grants agency in this respect to a character. All right, so totally under-argued, but what I've been trying to push back against is the idea that we should look within you to find this homunculus, this feature of your psychology that characterizes who you really are. Instead, we should think in a broad way and look at everything that's going on about you and use that to draw this distinction um, in this way. So where does that leave us? I wanna draw three important. That finishes the first part of the talk. And now in the second part, I wanna focus on drawing out these three important consequences about dehumanization, about discord, and about silencing. Let's take dehumanization first. So there's a ton to say about dehumanization. Uh, dehumanizing treatment uh, uh, can be characterized, can be deeply rooted psychologically in our capacity to make the divisions between us and them. Um, there's so much to say about this that I won't be able to say, but here's my path in to how I think that evaluativism of a person has something to tell us about ways that we can treat each other and ways that bring each other down as persons or that are dehumanizing. And that's that if evaluativism, the value of holes in a person is true, then we can get each other wrong. If the answer to what is really you and what's merely your predicament is the answer that's given by the best interpretation, then even if we're trying really hard to get the best interpretation of you, we might not have the best interpretation of you. And if we don't have the best interpretation of you, then we can, make, we can be prone to make two kinds of errors. First, we could overproject. We could treat features of your predicament as if they're features of you as a protagonist. We could look at the case of the unwilling addict and we could say, hey, you know, that's your addiction. You, uh, you, know, you should have uh, gone to treatment yesterday. It's, it's there because that is something that's part of you. Uh, we could take somebody who snaps at you out of anger uh, and we could um, uh, uh, take very seriously what they're saying and try to engage with their angry response instead of looking past it because it's merely, they're merely hungry and they need a Snickers bar. So we've got this kind of problem of overprojection, but also we can underproject. We can treat uh, the protagonist uh, as if there's merely part of the predicament. So for example, uh, uh, you might say, uh, your child might say, hey, um, the um, uh, Barbies are uh, you know, having a party with the Legos. I can't clean up my room. And as a parent, uh, you say, you're thinking, okay, get over it. You know, it's time to clean the room. Uh, it's not really that important. Uh, you don't value it that much. You just feel strongly about it right now, and then you'll be over it. But the child might be thinking, no, this is really important. I'm telling you it's important. And, um, and uh, you take it seriously. Um, when we, when we underproject, typically what we're doing is we take something that really is part of who somebody is, um, and we treat it as part of their predicament. So not to take another example uh, that I've just talked about in another paper. Uh, maybe my wife comes home from work and she compliments my gardening. And I think to myself, huh, I wonder if she found a coin in a vending machine this afternoon. Um, when I start to think about her, find her behavior, her compliment is coming from a good mood and the good mood is coming from finding a coin in a vending machine. I've started to exclude it from thinking of it as something about her as a protagonist. I started to treat it as something that's part of her predicament. When we think, when we respond to people in this way, it brings us down. This opens the door. It's infantilizing, really, is what it is. And it opens the door uh, to treating people in other kinds of ways that don't respect their authentic wishes in ways that are not autonomous. Because since uh, what they're doing and perhaps what they say they care about are things that uh, don't matter, there's features of what they have to deal with. There are also features of what we have to deal with. And so we don't need to respect those features of them in the same way that we would need to respect their authentic wishes or things that are important to them. Uh, and so I think this opens the door to this kind of depersonalizing, I would say, or dehumanizing treatment. And it opens it in a way 
that I think does not require bad will. It might well be, indeed it is true, that most dehumanizing behavior involves bad will. But what I think is important about this is that it's not just that there are psychological causes that, are, that perhaps could be eradicated. If I'm right, then part of it is to what it is to relate to somebody as a person is to recognize that some aspects of their behavior or their bodies is not genuinely their own. And, uh, uh, and that leads to the possibility we can make mistakes about what that is. If we make such a mistake, then we're on the path to dehumanizing them in an important way. And so I think this gives us a wedge where we can start to see how it is that we can start to get differences between us and them. To go, to, to go down a path where even with people who are close to you, uh, you could start to uh, have more and more conflict with them. And that's going to lead me to the topic of discord. So discord, as I understand it, is uh, this distinctive kind of conflict that arises in interpersonal relationships. It often involves features of this depersonalizing or dehumanizing con uh, treatment where we, we treat somebody, we don't respect their wishes in important ways. And discord is facilitated uh, because misunderstandings of which is somebody's acts and attitudes are generally their own can be in good faith. Since um, ultimately uh, knowing who they are and knowing which attitudes and actions are authentically theirs and which are less truly theirs is a matter of finding the best interpretation. And we're not perfect at finding the best interpretation. When our values aren't perfect, we're not going to find it. Um, we can in good faith be trying to do that and still make these mistakes where we over project or where we under project. And that's going to lead to these distinctive kinds of misunderstandings between two people. So you might understand somebody in a way that's not the same as the way that they understand themselves. And likewise, the way that they understand you might be different from how you understand yourself. Um, and uh, uh, that's because each of you, when you're interpreting them and they're interpreting their, themselves, they're looking for the best interpretation. And if your values are a little bit different, you'll come to different interpretations. Likewise, when you're interpreting yourself and they're interpreting you, you're like both looking for the best interpretation. And if your values diverge, you might come to different interpretations. Indeed, in this way, differences in interpretation are gonna be a consequence of differences in values. And what this is gonna to lead to is it's gonna to lead to the feeling that each of you can have that the other one's not getting you right. That the other one is either over projecting or under projecting. You will think that they're over projecting if they ascribe things to you that you ascribe to your environment or to other causes acting on you or in you. And you will think that they're under projecting if they fail to ascribe things to you and instead ascribe them to your environment, uh, things that you think are really important and really part of who you really are. Okay, uh, and indeed, I've argued in other related work that when it is that the basis of your interpretation is very of, of you yourself and both your and their interpretation of yourself and your and their interpretation of them are very closely related, perhaps because you are friends or lovers or siblings or parent and child and have a lot of common experiences and it's your common experiences that are the basis of your interpretation. Or even if you're strangers, but part of the basis of your interpretation are your reactions to common things that are very salient in your environment. Perhaps your reactions to the ascendancy of Donald Trump. In either of those cases where there's this common basis of the interpretation, it's very likely that the same differences in values that drive differences in your interpretation of them are gonna drive differences in your interpretation of you. And hence, it won't merely be that we'll have one-sided misunderstandings of them or of you, but rather that we're gonna get differences in misunderstanding of them that match or correlate to differences in misunderstanding of you. Okay, so, and that's a really important feature, I think, of the phenomenon that I call discord. Now, how does discord uh, sub subsist? How does it last? Uh, part of the answer to how discord lasts has to do with the fact that under projection is, is in two important respects worse than over projection. It's worse because under projection is dehumanizing, whereas over projection isn't in the same way. But it's also worse because under projection can lead to a kind of silencing. And the reason it can lead to a kind of silencing is that speech is behavior. So if some of your behavior is taken as being not genuinely yours, then it's in principle possible that even some of your speech can be taken as not genuinely yours. This is the phenomenon that Mary Kate McGowan in her book 
uh, describes as what she calls uh, type four silencing. I call it attributive silencing because what it is, is it's a case where there's something that's genuinely attributable to you, that belongs to you, some aspect of your speech, it's something you really said that your interlocutor might recognize that you said, they can see there's a real genuine illocutionary act that's been performed, but see that act as a feature of your body, but not something that's attributable to you in the proper sense. It doesn't come from your true self. And when that happens, there's a very natural sense in which you've been silenced. Your interlocutors could respect you, could aim to respect your true wishes, uh, and could have seen as maybe also aim to respect your untrue wishes, you know, the things, the things that you want, but you don't really care about, but just care less about respecting your untrue wishes, the things that you want, but don't deeply care about, than they care about respecting your true wishes. And as long as that's true, then uh, it's going to easily become the case that even your attempts to overcome this by talking to each other uh, could be systematically frustrated. And that's why I think discord can persist even between lonely and pivotal. Not just that can happen, but can persist over time. All right, so McGowan, as I've said, introduces this kind of silencing, type four silencing, I call it attributive silencing. The kind of conflict that I've characterized as discord does not require genuine silencing in the fact of sense. It doesn't require that either person uh, is interpreted in a way that excludes something that's genuinely them. What it requires is that each person feels that way because I speak up and I say, hey, this is really important, listen to me. Um, I would really like you to uh, stop uh, folding the towels that way. That's something that's very important to me. And uh, the other person's like, okay, whatever. I know you feel strongly about that, but you don't really care about that. Uh, and so this conflict persists. Um, uh, and when we have conflicts that persist in the face of this, the first person feels silence. They feel like the other person hasn't really listened to them. But that feeling comes from their own interpretation of themselves. But they could be wrong too. It could be that it's not really that important to them how the towels are folded and that their spouse or roommate or friend is right to not take that seriously as something that's really important to them or something they really strongly care about. Um, so what drives discord is the perception of silencing. But we could also ask what happens when somebody is genuinely silenced, when what it is that they really said is something that is not attributed to them because people interpret them in such a way that that doesn't count as part of what they're really contributing or really trying to say. Um, and uh, uh, so I just said that mutual misunderstanding does not require silencing in an effective sense, but we could be interested in what happens when there is genuine silencing. And one of the things that I think is really striking about what evaluative about persons contributes to thinking about attributive silencing is that really substantially changes the stakes for arguing for the empirical commitments of what it takes for there to be some groups of people that are systematically silenced in systematic ways. And the way to see that is to see how it is that many other philosophical accounts of silencing, uh, among them uh, you know, those of Ray Langton, but also many others, are really divide up between having a conceptual component and an empirical component. In the conceptual component, what theorists argue is they show how there's a particular phenomenon that in principle is possible and perhaps definitely happens in some cases. It definitely happens in some cases that people can uh, perform locutionary acts that don't end up performing the normal locutionary act that will be performed by that utterance because of special circumstances that they're in. Definitely possible. Um, the empirical question is whether that in fact happens with respect to a wide range of normal kinds of cases that it would take for it to turn out that women, for example, are systematically silenced with respect to their ability to say no to sex. Um, and the conceptual component on many, many, many accounts of silencing is easy. The way the conceptual component works is it articulates something that de is a definite possibility absent some minor wrangling over how speech act theory works. The difficult part is almost always the empirical component. In the empirical component, um, you know, the hypothesis uh, that, um, that in fact, uh, uh, all women or most women are in this position with respect to very certain kinds of speech acts uh, is much more difficult to establish than the conceptual component. 
I'm not saying that it's not true. I'm just saying that the work is on the empirical side and not on the conceptual side. This is even true for attributive silencing or type four silencing uh, in the absence of, of evaluation about persons. If we think that what your true self is, it's just a matter of a special part of your psychology and uh, not this evaluative question, uh, then it's gonna be easy to establish that there's such a thing as getting somebody wrong, as taking something to come from that special part of their psychology, their will or the, uh, 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 an identity under which they value themselves or the like. Uh, and uh, see, that's, that's, even though it's not actually coming from that, uh, but the empirical question of, of like how it could be that in fact, there's some systematic pattern that people happen to often be interpreted as some things coming from their will or conception of their identity in which they value themselves uh, is very hard to establish. But in contrast, on the, the evaluative view about persons, we're gonna get uh, departures from, uh, the, the value about persons is hard to establish this conceptual component. Because to get the conceptual component of the value of the about persons, we need to argue that the correct account of persons is evaluative. So I've only been gesturing at that picture today. Uh, there's a lot of hard work there. The hard work is on the conceptual side. But once we have that hard work set in on the conceptual side, the empirical component is really easy. And that's because all that's required on the value about persons in order for there to be systematic departures between how people are interpreted as what is genuinely their own and what isn't. It's first the case that there are systematic uh, dis distortions in values that connect specifically to gender or to race. And that I think is cheap. It's obvious that there are systematic distortions in values that are systematically connected to gender and to race. And that's all that it takes for it to be the case systematically that we're gonna get differences in how we interpret people uh, from what's genuinely true of them. Because when it is that people are subject to distorted values, they're going to apply interpretive frameworks. They're gonna lead, despite their best effort to come up with the best interpretation, are still gonna get the wrong interpretation. All right. So let me draw two more observations. When we are led in this way, sorry, when the, on the evaluative conception of persons, it's not only empirically easy for, to recognize the uh, widespread possibility of systematic uh, silencing, we can also see how um, uh, pernicious some forms of the silencing can be. In, in fact, it can even derive from values that look like they are purely positive. So for example, it might be the case in principle, not, I think, in, in fact, our, our world involves all kinds of negative uh, values attached to gender. But one of the things that happens in the real world, I think, is that there are just again positive values that are attached to female gender roles. Values that are concerned with service and caring and perhaps sexual availability, uh, or perhaps greater valuing sexual contributions of women than sexual contributions of men. And that's enough, I think. We don't need to have negative values attached to groups in order to uh, have consequences for how people belonging to those groups are silenced. Because if the best interpretation of somebody is the one that that question is valuably related in a way that could lead the coastal liberal and the uh, religious leader uh, to come to different conclusions about whether it is that same-sex attraction is part of somebody's identity uh, because of the way, different ways that they value uh, um, uh, acting on same-sex attraction. Um, it could easily be the case that when we value some things more, that's going to lead us to interpretation that's going to create greater scope for those things, and hence less scope for other things. And so I think that all it takes on this picture, although more details need to be filled in than what I'm able to say here today, all it takes on this picture for there to be silencing of women in certain respects, for example, in their ability to say no to sex, is that uh, women's sexual performance is valued more than men's sexual performance. And then women are gonna be more susceptible to be silenced with respect to that in other cases. And the same thing applies in other kinds of cases. So for example, 
if um, <coughs> if white coastal progressive liberals uh, are are very good at not attaching negative values or ideas on the basis of race, but on the other hand, do attach some positive values to their uh, one or two black friends that they help them feel good about not attaching negative values to race. Uh, that's going to be a problem too, because merely attaching this extra positive thing is going to be uh, such that it's going to make it harder for them to come to an interpretation that grants that their black friend is being uh, authentically critical in the right kind of way. And it's going to raise the stakes for what's required for their black friend to be interpreted as being authentic and really uh, speaking for themselves in saying things that are more highly critical uh, in ways uh, that that white friend is going to recognize. And so I think this is um, important and I think it's true. Um, so final thought, and then I'll uh, let you guys tell me everything that's wrong with what I just said. Uh, um, you know, LinkedIn, I, mean, I get here by, I, I started on this whole path seven years ago, uh, thinking about LinkedIn's uh, paper duty and desolation. She presents this correspondence between Kant and Marie von Herbert and the end of the article is consumed with showing how it is that Kant brings down Maria von Herbert, objectifies her, and really silences her. And yet, the specific kind of diagnosis of silencing that LinkedIn has developed in so much of her other work look like they didn't quite fit with this picture. The picture that I'm describing is the picture that I get from thinking about how it is that LinkedIn richly describes Kant's treatment of Maria von, Her von Herbert. I think it's what's going on in that case, and I think it can happen much of the time. Uh, so that's it, there's two parts, and I'm eager to hear what you guys have to say. Wild applause from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, Mark, that was, um, that was law. Oh, yes, we have. See, there is verified applause in the chat. Um, okay, so so that was the talk, and now we're ready to move to the Q and A. So, um, so as I said, uh, for the Q and A, use the raise your hand function. A few people have put their hand up already. Um, I'll get rolling with the Q in a moment. You can also put, if you have a question, you can write it in the Q and A. Box, but I won't go to that in, until we run dry of live action questions. Um, you're welcome to keep using the chat. Of course, I may or may not be paying attention to that since I'll be trying to monitor the queue. Now, a word about how, how this will work with the Q&A. So um, I'll, it'll, it'll be live action. So when I call on you, I'll, I'll make you allowed to talk. And then I'm going to ask you if it's all right for for you to come on the video and if you say yes um i'll click a few buttons and your video will come on uh it's okay if you don't want to do that of course um but uh of course we'd all love to see uh to see everyone's smiling faces as the case may be um okay so so let's uh let's get started with the q a so to begin uh all right, I see, I'm gonna call on Dave Shoemaker. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go, Dave. Dave, uh, are you okay with me turning on your video? Uh, yeah. Okay, it'll just take one second, so awkward pause. Should be working. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, can you? Let's see. Hold on. I can switch on here. I should be able to. How much okay. trouble? How much trouble am I in? Well, no. This is <laughs> this is good. <laughs> there you are. This is really good stuff. I, I don't know. Can you see me? Yeah. 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 Okay. Ah, there I am. All right. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Mark. And I wish I could see who else is here to say hi. And thanks a lot, Gwen. This is this is awesome idea. I'm really glad you're doing this. Um, I want to. There's so much here, Mark, that I would like Sorry, to ask yeah. you about, but I'll try to keep it focused. 
uh, and try to focus on the motivation and especially the connection to Frankfurt. How much do you really need him? And why couldn't you have done without him? I mean, so here's the, here's the issue. Yeah. Um, he was motivated to investigate this project, I think primarily by considerations of uh, moral responsibility. Yeah. And so um, we want to know, he says, what makes us different from animals with respect to something like moral responsibility. And so we're persons and that's, that's a difference. And let's investigate what it is about us that is different from animals. We've got this self-reflective capacities. And as a result, we can, you know, pause and think about our desires and evaluate, or not evaluate them, but, you know, have desires about those desires and so forth. Um, and other people who have followed in his footsteps have been trying to articulate conditions of attributability that will enable us to make discriminations that we already make in our practices with respect to things like compulsions, manias, addictions, versus those the non- uh, uh, versions of those cases in which people we take to be responsible. And so there you're looking for something that's internal to the agent, right? That's going to help differentiate between the cases that are compulsive, manic, so forth, and uh, for which people can be rightly held responsible and uh, those that, or that they can't, and then those that, that are attributable to them. So that I think restricts the project a little bit in the way that you were wanting to, you're wanting to expand it by connecting it up to the personhood stuff. And yeah. another issue is this, that there's a distinction in the literature between authenticity and uh, authoritativeness, that it seems like sometimes there's a conflation on your part or it wasn't clear. And, it's, and, okay. and at the end, it felt like you're pushing the authenticity side. Which yeah, I don't think I said authoritative anywhere, but I did say authentic a couple of times. That's right. That's right. And, and people like the um, authoritative stuff because they think that that's what connects this up to questions of responsibility. What sorts of actions and attitudes are authoritative with respect to self-determination? And so that's the connection to responsibility. So, I mean, I, 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 I totally get that the personhood stuff in general, no. absolutely, you should take an evaluative approach to that. Um, uh, but I'm not so sure the connection to the Frankfurt and whether or not you even need it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So um, I'm not sure what I think about authoritative. I, I got to work my way through all the A's still, but the, uh, but the, um, and, and maybe I don't need Frank and there's a certain sense in which I don't need Frankfurt. If there's something that I took away from Frankfurt, which is that the, um, just the thing that I said that, that uh, there is this important distinction that we make when we uh, look at somebody and their behavior and we sort of treat some of it as stuff to be engaged with and some of it to be stuff to be looked past. Um, it is, uh, I think of it as closely connected to more responsibility because my path into it is more through Strassen than through Frankfurt. Um, I, um, I just think that Strassen too easily makes it sound like it's on or it's off and not like there can't be different aspects of the very same behavior at the very same time that are mixed in this way. Um, part of what I think about the compulsions and the addictions in those kinds of cases is that I think it's, I worry that it's too quick to uh, classify them all on one side with respect to moral responsibility. Um, now, uh, so insofar as that's like a high level constraint that we want to get some things to all, like certain psychological conditions to all happen on one side. And that's a question about how we draw the line to get them all to happen on one side. Um, uh, I agree, I got, there's no leverage there. And uh, it, I just worry that, um, that we don't want them to all happen on one side, that um, uh, uh, in the same way that, that August uh, Gorman, I think, has you know, argued that we want some of them to, you know, whether you accept them or not can make a difference. Uh, I, I kind of want that, except for I don't want to give you first personal authority to accept it or not. Um, I think that I want to push back against the first personal authority that, um, that August would get for those kinds of cases. To help a little bit, we should have a longer talk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll let others. I'll let us speak. I'll write you. And uh, thank you so much. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. No, this is great. I look, I look forward to it. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Okay, I'm gonna do this. And next, I'm gonna call on 
Janice Dowell. Hi, Jan, we can hear you now. Ken, um, would you like to turn your video on? Sure, if I can. Hi, Jan. Hi. Uh, so, pause and you should appear in a moment. Sorry, can you still, oh, here we go. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're, uh, yeah. you're not mine. Um, oh, good, I can't even see myself. So <laughs> <laughs> so all, all the pain is yours. You look um, good. So, uh, yeah, so I have a question about, I'm hoping you can say more about this claim that the empirical stuff comes out easy on this view. Um, oh, yeah, go ahead. By saying a little bit more about what it takes for an interpretation or a narrative to be the best one, especially since um, you note that uh, self-reports, even sincere self-reports are not decisive evidence. Mm -hmm. um, or for an, a, an account of the explanation for why someone did what they did or want, wants what they want, et cetera. So yeah, so maybe maybe, I, I, maybe that's a big topic. So if you could just say more about what it takes for a narrative or a um, to be the best narrative in a way that's sufficiently constrained that we could, we could apply it to specific cases. Yeah, so, um... I was cheating a little bit because in the earlier part, I said I wasn't trying to put my whole view on the table, uh, but I might need a little bit more of the whole view than I was acknowledging okay. uh, uh, here. Uh, my whole view, what makes an interpretation the best is that it's gonna grant um, uh, the greatest scope for, it's going to greatest contribution, uh, kind of a scope for agency, which involves a kind of scope for agency and also a kind of value of positive agency. And I think it's the value of positive agency that is what explains why it is that the coastal liberal and the uh, conservative church leader are going to interpret the uh, young person with this, uh, experiencing this conflict between what they believe is important and their attractions in different ways. It's because the, the coastal liberal is going to uh, grant things that would come out of that as positive agency, as being positive, whereas the uh, religious leader is going to see that as negative. Um, so um, the... Uh, Can I ask a follow-up yeah. question? Just yeah. really quickly on the positive negative agency. Um, is that a characterization of... I, I think maybe I don't, I don't know that. I'm not familiar with that distinction. So is the conservative person in that case the attribution of... I thought they're, they, ne they're I thought, negative on homosexuality. Right, but they're also going to deny agency in that case. I thought that was one of the points of the... Yeah, because... Okay. It's not agency that's negative. It's that they deny agency. No, it's that it's because that agency would be negative. That they withhold... That, the that they, they withhold looking for it. So just like, uh, you know, I snap at you at three in the afternoon, and you're like, wait, Mark, did you have lunch? And I'm like, no, you give me a Snickers bar. Um, so the part of the, I claim, part of why we look for that is because this was negative to begin with. Not exhaustive, and it's not just because it's negative, we won't rule out. Maybe I was angry at you all along, but I was too deferential to let it, let it go until I was really hungry. Uh, so, in that case, I think granting me more agency would be um, saying, no, I really was angry. But uh, I think that when we overlook the snap because of hanger, uh, we're being attuned to uh, tamping down this uh, negative stuff. And in the same way, if I'm the church leader and um, I've got this teenager who comes in and um, they're confessing to me about heading out to the gay night club last night. Um, um, I, I'm seeing it that way. Uh, uh, initially through this lens of uh, something that has to be overcome. And perhaps at some point a bridge is crossed where uh, it becomes so persistent and a consistent feature of their circumstances that I start seeing it as they've embraced it. And then it's their positive agency that they embraced it in that way. Um, and I think that we, we cross that. At some point, we, we switch from interpreting 
looking past negative stuff to sometimes making somebody else to be the bad guy. And then we grant more agent, we, we got more agency to the negative stuff um, when we make them enough of a bad guy. Um, and so I think, so I think that that's what's going on in the, in the systematicity of silencing uh, kind of case is that, um, is that really there just are these distorted values about uh, what it's great for women to do and what it's great for men to do. Um, and I even think that, that the distortion could in principle consist in only valuing more things about women, but valuing them in a distorted way. And that would have this effect that when you, when you compare those values and you look at how to interpret somebody to get the most of them, you're gonna, uh, by prioritizing, by over prioritizing some stuff more than it's really worth, um, you're gonna end up under prioritizing some stuff that really is worth more. Um, and so that's the, the sense in which I think it is empirically weak that I think that there's are pervasive and extensive uh, distortions in values in our society about gender. Um, um, so it more has to be said to sort of get sp specific respects in which people are silenced. But I think that um, it's very plausible that some of them are connected to things like sex um, uh, and criticism. And those are respects in which, uh, those are like at the top of the list of ways in which uh, uh, women are claimed to be silenced. We can talk a little bit more. I'm, I'm thinking about how this idea of values distorting and something being part of the best narrative are interacting together. And yeah, but I'll, I'll follow up with some other questions. Awesome. I would really love that. Thank you. Hey, thank you. So uh, next, I'm going to call on David Barnett. So David Barnett, I'm going to allow you to talk now. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, David, have you had your hand up the whole time? Well, I didn't have to, I didn't <laughs> have to actually hold it up, right? Okay. Yeah, well, that's convenience of Zoom. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay. Uh, are you cool with me turning on your video? Sure, sure. Okay, here we go. Go for it, David. Hey. Um, I can't see myself, but anyway. Um, Just go for it. Okay, cool. It'll so, um, I, really, really interesting talk. That was great. Um, I was just, uh, I was curious about the, like the um, connection between the first and the and the second parts. Um, mm -hmm. So, there's a denial of the like uh, the Frankfurt view um, that you need to look for a distinctive type of uh, psychological cause. And I guess I was just wondering how far you think that gets you towards some of the positive claims that you appealed to in the consequences discussion about like silencing and stuff. So yeah. um, I guess I could see how a, like a natural alternative to the, the distinctive psychological cause view is some kind of holism, right? It's like, well, you gotta just look at the big picture of how all of these different impulses and uh, you know stuff in a person's mind add up and explain their behavior um, but it seemed like you um, uh, you on you really made a lot of use of um, this uh, uh, assumption that I think you said you defended in another uh, paper um, that part of the right holistic method for adding it all up like maximizes the person's goodness? Not quite, but close, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, or, right. So, yeah, anyway, I guess I just, I, I wasn't clear on, are you, I guess I was kind of on board with the, the general idea behind holism, but um, yeah. that seemed like a big further step. And cool, let me show you what you can get. That really let mattered me, a lot for some of the you. Let me show you what I think you can get. Yeah. So in the dehumanization bit, yeah. What I wanted to suggest is that we're susceptible to it. That it's not like an, it's not just a psychological, empirical thing that we can go and do some sociology, some history, some psychology, 
uh, studies and find out that we do this us and them stuff. But I want to suggest that there's something about being persons related to each other as persons that opens us up to treat each other in ways that kind of feel like they bring us down. And there I think that, that all we really need is to not have sort of first person authority over what's really us and what isn't. And as long as we don't have this first person authority over what's really us and what isn't, then um, uh, we could, um, uh, well, actually there's less, there's less than that really. But what we need is that it's something that we could easily make mistakes about with respect to somebody else. So we can over project or we can under project. And lacking first personal authority makes it just a little bit easier to over project or under project in good faith because you don't have to always respect what somebody says about themselves. Um, under the discord, I think that uh, part of why I want to get there is there's this kind of misunderstanding when uh, we have different understandings about which of the stuff I said is really me and which stuff isn't. Um, and there I think that you can get a lot of that without the distinctive view about how this holistic evaluative view works. Um, I like the idea that it's evaluative in some respect um, because I think that that explains how it is that it's bound to happen. Uh, and that it's bound to happen often enough that it could play a persistent role in a variety of relationships that people could you know, just have stuff that they never quite get over that they fall into persistent conflict with, with respect to somebody. And it's not all just like bad actors or people being, you know, having, um, being inauthentic. Um, I think that it helps the distinctive view I have uh, helps because it helps to explain why it is that it'll be parallel. But I think that we need richer cases to, for me to talk through to sort of tell you why I want it to be parallel. And then in the silencing part, I think that um, that it the question that Jan had about how easy it is empirically um, uh, turns on it. Whereas, you know, it could be right that there is this, this that it's one other way in which people can be silenced. Um, it could be a contributing factor, or it could be the ground floor, or it could be an extra layer of various other kinds of silencing in the ways that Mary Kate McGowan suggests um, without being empirically easier. I think it's empirically easier because the values that go into the interpretation can include, you know, just what we think is important about what different people do. And I think that is clearly, so I think that's the piece that we would miss. Right. Okay. So yeah, cause that was the part where I felt like I wasn't sure I was following the dialectics. So just, just so I get, I get it. Um, um, you're thinking it doesn't take, it doesn't take much to just motivate the, the idea that we can over project and under project. No. Um, but, uh, it, but maybe you do need to appeal to your brand of evaluativism um, in the silencing cases to have it be empirically easy because you're thinking that's just driven by people having different values attached to like race and gender and uh, yeah. You know that's empirically cheap or something, and so then just, it's only we, it's only if it's that there. makes a direct difference to um, whether you interpret something as part of a person's like uh, predicament or part of the protagonist uh, that that yeah. you're going to get the results you want in those cases. Yeah. Okay. Now I get it. Okay. Okay. Thanks. That was great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, we're getting an ever quite a large queue now. Sorry. Um, <laughs> no, no. I'll go faster. This is great. So uh, next, I'm going to call on Jason Ribley. Jason, we can hear you now. I hope. Hi there. Uh, go for it, Jason. Is it all right if I turn the video on? Yes, please. That's fine. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Keep going. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, just a second here. Uh, oh, sweet. There you go. So. Um, great credibility bookcase. Uh, the what goes into making for the best story. And um, I guess like one issue is that it seems like there's a lot of uh, distinct factors that could play independent roles there. So we could talk about the story that was the most empowering for the person looking forward. We could talk about the one that attributes the most authorship and causal, causal efficacy to them 
in the here and now. We can talk about the one that attributes the mo that, that attributes authorship or efficacy for the best stuff, like morally and prudentially praiseworthy behavior or traits or something like that. And um, even if we could get clear on exactly how those dimensions interact, uh, it seems to me that one risk is uh, we're very rarely going to have access to the best story about a person. And probably they won't have access to it about themselves and uh, their interlocutors won't have access to it about themselves or about their interlocutor. And so I guess I, the threat I see is that um, there's going to be a lot of discord. Uh, I think there we're, is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> almost all, we're we're uh, lacking understanding of each other kind of in the way that like people in psychoanalysis think we like, that we lack understanding of one another because we're always projecting in maladaptive ways and so forth. So, yep. okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, in a way, that's what I think. Now, how bad is that? I mean, the, I didn't say anything about the metaphysics of value. True. Um, if, if we are realists about value, then there's something, there's a, there's a, the, the, the setup that you, that you gave um, is uh, that, you know, that we're always missing you know, like ships in the night, not just we're missing like ships in the night, but like we're missing, you know, the real thing. Um, um, but all, everything I said is compatible with expressivism. And so that all the talk about the true self or who you really are or who you are as a person is to be interpreted in expressivist terms. Um, that, that's true. And, even, even on a yeah. subjectivist view or an expressivist view, it seems like you're going to have to build in uh, room for air of different kinds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're going to get it. And and part of what's going to happen is that when different people have different values, we're going to get this difference in interpretation. Uh, my interpretation of you is different from yours of yourself. So I think you're wrong about yourself and you think I'm wrong about you. Um, and your interpretation of me is different from mine of me. So I think you're wrong about me and you think I'm wrong about me. Um, and that's when we get Discord now how important it is depends on how central those things are to our relationship. And I think minor differences in values are going to lead to minor differences. And big differences in values are going to lead to bigger differences. And part of I think the dynamics, uh, the unappreciated dynamics of, of polarization is ways in which the minor differences lead to bigger differences. Because as we listen to each other less, because we have these minor differences, that helps our values diverge over time. And as our values diverge over time, it makes it harder and harder to listen to each other. And we end up further apart. So I think that it's, I think, underappreciated conceptually how political polarization starts in the family, especially by Thanksgiving dinner. Um, and we've seen, I think most of us have seen our families split in a lot of ways and become less and less understanding of each other, particularly over the last 20 years. Yeah. And, um, and I think that when we focus on the extreme case, you know, sort of, it's like focus on end stage cancer, you know, <laughs> that, that's great, but like it, it starts with, you know, a cell mutation and, right. uh, and stuff that seems small. And so I think it's kind of, it's an extension of phenomena that arise in ordinary personal relationships where I think, I think nobody's free of it. I think maybe this seems like autobiography about my personal relationships, but <laughs> there's always something that comes back and you get frustrated with people and feel like they're not really listening to what you have to say or you fight about stuff that's small or, and you never, you always have the same fight. Um, mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think this is, it's all over the place. Well, uh, thanks very much. Very interesting talk. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Jason. Uh, all right, next I'm gonna call on David Enoch. David. Okay, should be allowed to talk now. Can I turn on your video? Please do. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm great. How are you? There'll be a little pause. We'll be back in a second. You there? Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 okay. So um, I I may have uh, I may have missed something. I'm not sure. No, you um, probably didn't. <laughs> well, uh, so this is about the the view of a person as the best interpretation. I should say I don't know the narrative interpretation literature at yeah. all well, but. Um, 
I, I think this starts out at least as something fairly small. The person is on this on this view the best interpretation of what exactly? Um, I sometimes say of their behavior, but I think it's not just behavior. It is so. Uh, but, but you see, the worry the worry is that yeah, uh, it's the best interpretation of the person. <laughs> Yeah, well, I have two views about this. Uh, part of me says, start with the human organism and then look for what interpretation of it right. excludes some stuff and includes some stuff so that the stuff that's included leads to the most interesting story. Um, and on that picture, we like get a story about persons that doesn't answer anything about like, identity over time or anything like that, uh, that's anchored in human organisms. Um, then part of me, when I get feeling even wilder than the part of my soul that I revealed so far today, um, thinks that actually the best interpretation stuff about narrative can make sense, can give attractive answers to stuff about, about identity over time of persons, you know, I think I could tell a science fiction story where people uh, fission and you're lefty and not righty. Um, and I wouldn't be part of the story that you're lefty. It's just like, I would tell the story and it'd be clear from the story that in the story you're lefty. Um, and I think I'd tell the, the a flip version of the story where you're righty. I think I could tell a story where you're both um, if I told the story right. Um, and when I, Think about it that way, then I start thinking, well, no, that's not, I can't anchor it in the body in the same sort of way. Uh, you have to do it in a different way. You have to look at, at interpreting the world in a way such that it finds some stories in the world. So uh, the, we don't like take the human organism as the input, but rather we look at which way of parceling up all the stuff is the one that parcels them into clumps that are persons. Um, and so there's different ways that I could see going. And so uh, in part, what I've said is neutral between them. Yeah, um, there's a, uh, maybe I'll put it in a, a form of a, a kind of a dilemma, right? So, so uh, it's possible that uh, you have sort of um, illegitimately gained plausibility by not being more precise about what it is an interpretation of or how yeah. you demarcate it. Right, so the yeah. danger is you could go in the ways you suggested no circularity at all. If you say what I interpret is the organ is the organ. Oh, sure, right? sure, sure, sure. That's okay. But I suspect partly for the reasons you mentioned, maybe there are others too, that that's not going to get you a very plausible view of what the person is. And you only get a plausible view if you get already as an input, the kind of demarcation. Uh, that you're the best interpretation of you. Oh, right. Something like that. That's yeah, very yeah. close to what we were out to explain to begin with, right? That's, that's anyway the word. Sure, sure. I, um, I'll just embrace the first horn, but, um, but I, it's important that I, you know, as I talked, um, especially because I was trying to throw it all out in one picture today. Um, uh, Literally in it, one picture. We have it in front of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah right there. <laughs> it, it, um, it, um, some of the, the, when I get in the intuitive mode of, the, of how to say it, yeah. That's, that's totally fair. Fair enough, thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, I am going to call on Amy Flowery. Hey, Amy. Hi. Um, can, I, can I turn on your video, Amy? Please do. Okay, short pause. Did yeah. Work? Be able to turn it on. There you are. Great to see you. <laughs> It was really exciting. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah. I was interested in what you say when there are two people who have very different sets of values um, and they're interpreting a single action, say it's one of those people. Yeah. And it's the best explanation of both of those internal narrative value sets that the, each person has to explain the action one way, to explain it the other. Yeah. Would you say that those are both a description of the action that took place? So here's, here's an example. A woman um, has young children and after a car accident, she needs a blood transfusion. She's Jehovah Witness, it's against her religion. Bravely, she stays true to her religious conviction 
and chooses to die as a matter of her own autonomy rather than taking yeah. it. You're the ER doctor and you're like, what's wrong with you? You're in the group. Get over it. Get over it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> your young children, your two-year-old needs you. Um, are both of those interpretations? Correct. Yeah. No, no. I think at most one of them is correct. Okay, but what is it that guarantees just one answer? Uh, Given that both best. narratives, let's be honest. <laughs> because uh, best um, is superlative. So, um, so one of them is best according to some values, mm -hmm. and the other is best according to other values. But, but we want the one that's best according to the correct values, and mm -hmm. only one of them is the correct values. So. That's something that I think I can say as uh, an evaluative realist. It's something that I think I can say even if I put on my expressivist hat. Um, and if I can't say it, then I don't want to put on the expressivist hat. Um, and um, so, well, so, so uh, yeah, so they disagree, they disagree about what, it, what the true description is. Yeah. Yeah. But so maybe the car accident case isn't plausible because we don't have an equal representation of people with both value sets here. But um, we can imagine one where there's like, so from God's view, there's a little bit of real value on this side of the interpretation, a little bit on this side. So they're both wrong in that case. They'll both be wrong. Yeah. Okay. That's what I would say. So there so are I, 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 don't, I don't want to say that one of them is right. I want to say that at most one of them is right. There are facts then that are being tracked independently of the narrative through which you interpret the person. Yeah. If you let me say that in a way that I could continue to say it in my expressivist mode, then I'll endorse it. <laughs> now, I'm not okay, endorsing the expressivist mode. I'm just trying to be neutral about whether I can occupy the expressivist mode. Because there is, there's, I grant you that there's something suspicious about this, is there really a best thought? Um, and that's what makes me a little bit kind of want to hang on to the the fact that everything I've said so far could be interpreted in the expressive, interpreted in the expressivist mode. Um, I so guess that, I was feeling yeah. more the pull of David Enoch's objection, which is that oh. what is it that this best explanation is tracking, if not the fact about what the person did in this instance? Yeah, that it goes the other way around. Uh, what makes it best is that it's the truth tracking interpretation. Yeah. 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 Well, I think that, you know, the evidence is that the way we're pulled about how to interpret in different cases uh, tracks uh, what we think is good or bad about lots of different stuff. And um, so I think it, it is true that the best is the one that's true, but it's, it's true because being true is being about what's best. Um, <laughs> if that mouthful made sense, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna move. So we have eight people left in the queue. I hope we can get to everyone. Um, so next I'm gonna call on Matt King. Matt. Should be able to talk now, Matt. Hello. I'm gonna get in trouble again. No, not really. Can no. I can I activate your video, Matt? Yes. Okay. One moment. You told me I wouldn't get in so much trouble with David. Yeah, I don't know that I got an approval to be seen. There you are. Uh, oh, sorry, it's because I clicked on the wrong person. It should have had it just a second. <laughs> sorry, Ian. <laughs> yeah. All right. Now we know who's next. <laughs> there we go. Um, oh, I should do this so people can actually see me. OK. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, so. I wanted to take a, I don't know, a really big step back um, and ask, this is similar to what other people have sort of pressed on, um, to ask about what sort of constraints there are on what can be a person on the account. Mm -hmm. um, and there's different ways we might sort of push um, to try and, or, or di there's harder and softer ways of pushing to try and suggest that more or less is being smuggled in at the at the beginning. And I think 
um, different people have been asking about that. So, so that's my main question yeah. was just about sort of what's the relationship between interpretation and the thing that we're interpreting such that um, there could be constraints on the, on, on what could count or fill the role of, of person. Um, so for example, can uh, marginal humans um, or uh, some animals or some or animals or systems, corporations or kind of persons uh, in a required sense or leave because story. So, so I was thinking yeah. about the metaphor, like lots of things can be protagonists yeah. um, without even really us needing to anthropomorphize them much mm -hmm. in ways that um, if you take the views that you're rejecting, the ones that look for some kind of psychological uh, mechanisms of a various sort and use that to help carve out persons, there'll be stuff that then will be ruled out because they can't have that psychological stuff. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering if there's any anything playing a similar role in... in so the answer is that I don't know. Like, I haven't figured that out yet. I, I feel like this opens up possibilities that Dave said at the beginning that he wants not to be opened, <laughs> that in terms of um, of what the scope is of of, of persons, it, it might be independent then of who counts as moral agents. Maybe there are, I want to distinguish between being a person and being a, a moral agent who I would take to be subject to moral criticism. Maybe once you're in the camp of moral agents, you're the stuff that's attributable to you is stuff that you are responsible for, but if you're not in the camp, there's some further threshold. Um, so maybe I just want to have an independent bar for what counts in that way. Um, when I really don't know how I, I feel, I feel like I know how to make the moves if I wanted to go different ways. I feel like I know if I want to exclude animals, I feel like I can do that if, you know, but, um, and then some days I wake up and I think, uh, that um, this lets me be a theist after all, given my uh, atheistic worldview, because if being, you know, the greatest agency in the world is something that's only instantiated by like humans collectively or something like that, then it turns out that, that God exists and it's just our collective action. So I, um, I really am deeply ambivalent about the scope of this. And I, I, I feel like extra conditions can be imposed in different ways that could carve it out. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, next. Um, so now I'm gonna call on Ann Jacobson. Sorry, Ann, I, I'm gonna, I, do, you, do you still have a question? Oh, you should be able to talk now. Ann. Hi, Ann, do you still have a question? Oh, oh, oh no, I did someone else too. I'm running all the ends. around. <laughs> And Jacobson, do you still have a question? Yes. I've, I, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Why do you ask? Oh, good. So, so you can go ahead and ask your question. Sorry, I clicked on you Early. accidentally a moment ago. Uh, would you like to activate your? Uh, would you like me to activate your video? Yes. Well, I don't know. Like is exactly right. <laughs> okay, hang on just one second. Uh, it'll, it'll just be a little pause. Okay, you should be able to turn on your video now. Turn it on? Yes, you should be able to. Oh, start video? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Where, oh, there we go. There we are. Sorry about that. Man. You see me. I don't see you all, but that's, I mean, Sorry. I, no, I see you all. I don't see me. That might be just as well that I'll feel less self-conscious. Anyway, this is my question. And I think it's, it's, it, it weaves in and out of things other people have been saying, and I could put it in various ways, but maybe one way is to put it as a worry that at the center of the theory is a fiction, that the, the, the true self is, is a fiction. And here's something that seems to me to put pressure under, on it. There are times in our lives when our values may change, and they may change very dramatically and very quickly. I think this happens 
often to people who win a big prize, money prize, mm -hmm. and their lives fall apart. But more familiarly, becoming a parent can change mm -hmm. what one's prone to, to choose within a few hours. And similarly, becoming married, all these sorts of things. So these large transitions can change what mm -hmm. would characterize one's true self. Uh, but there are lots of small transitions that may make a huge difference. I yeah. mean, I think, for example, I've become a much better cat owner. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not sure <laughs> what the transitions were, but there were probably some big ones there. Uh, and if I become a vegetarian, maybe there was some. So that's the worry. I don't have much to say to back up, except that there isn't a one true self. Yeah. There are a succession at most of these clusters of characteristics. It's awesome. a human. Yeah, let, let me say two things about that. So the, the first is that I think that you're building in more into what you think it takes for there to be a true self than I am. So I'm just thinking that you exist uh -huh. and you're a person. Uh -huh. So th there are properties of you. Um, and so that's cheap. So the sense in which there is a true self is just the sense in which that there's a self, that you are yourself and you are a person. So yourself is a person. And I, that seems like a sound argument to me. Well, well that doesn't seem very it doesn't uh, deep. That's not very good for, for settling any, good. any disagreements. So, but then there's the question of what you are. And right. on a lot of, a lot of, it often gets built in to talk about the true self, that there are like enduring traits. Um, uh, and you're, you're pointing out rightly that those change over time and sometimes in quite significant ways that we can't anticipate. And that's actually part of why I think that we need to have a holistic account of who you are as a person. That I think needs to be holistically, holistic, not just between different features of you, but also over time because mm -hmm. Uh, I think that it can't be the case that like your earlier self is authoritative or your later self is authoritative and it turns out that you weren't really the person you thought you were earlier or that you like, just had two different selves and it's not really the same person. I think that that appeal to the best narrative over time can encompass these changes and can make sense of them. And it can be, and none of the specific traits are the ones that are the ones that are constituent of the self. Rather, they're they're temporal traits. Just like I can get bigger, uh, you know, get taller or wider, as the case may be. Uh, you know, I can, uh, you know, grow a beard or shave my head. Um, you know, it's not that. Just like I'm not, you know, essentially haired or um, or um, you know, uh, uh, overweight. Um, I can be not essentially. Um, a cat lover, and so on. So I think that those are traits I can have at a time, and then the who I am is the story that attaches them to me at different times. And somebody who grew into being a cat lover, um, as um, or somebody who um, uh, gave up their dream to uh, become a musician after they I couldn't cut out at music school and became a motivational speaker instead. Um, yes. So I, I thought I might think at different points in time that my story goes one way, but then um, there might be failures of self-knowledge as it turns out that my story goes a different yes. way. Yeah. Yes, I guess, I guess I'm guess i then wondering about your, your talk about um, in settling a dispute, uh, appealing to one's true self or who's got it right about one's true self. And I think maybe that's a feature that you, of your discourse that you might want to be a little bit more careful uh, because often it sounds as though there's going to be one story for over a long period of time and of course there may not be there may well not be one story or yeah. one person presumably um that's possible it, it goes back to this question that like that matt asked about what is the interpretation of yes and exactly. um and i think that if i uh if i and uh, David asked us, yeah. if, I, if it's interpretation of um, a human organism, then it's got to be a single story. 
If it's just yeah. looking for the best interpretations that hang together, maybe it'll get split up. Yeah. And so there's an aspect of this sec that second way of going that yes. could have different conditions of identity over time that, that could, that it's consistent with everything I've said here that it could get split up. I'm, yeah. I'm cautious about that because I think there's a sense in which people, I'm not the same person I was when I was 18, but I also think that I should be held accountable for like what I did when I was 18 and yeah. that, that shouldn't break. Yeah. Um, and I, um, and I, I'm moved by stuff that Maureen Schechtman has to say about this while thinking that we should take the narrative and make it a continuous account uh, rather than saying that the narrative allows us to have separate things. So, yes. um, yeah. 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 Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. It's yeah, a great talk. Thank okay. You. Thank you. So we're going to um, move to the next. So it's only 10 minutes or so left, and I want to get to it as many people as possible, at least three of our seven. Let's aim for that. Well, we'll see. Okay. So next, I'm going to call on Gary Watson. Hey, Gary. Should be able to talk. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Indeed. Can I make it so we can see your video? You may. Yeah. Okay. One moment. Mm. I guess. Thank, yeah. th thanks so much, Gary. How much trouble am I in? No. <laughs> Just a sec. I'm trying to, uh, I guess I start my video. There we yeah. Go. There we go. Uh, thanks for the rich presentation, Mark. I, I really liked it. I have a, a suggestion and then a, a question or a comment. Um, I think you might use uh, to some good good purpose a conception of the person that uh, Charles Taylor defends. I think it would be worth your working with it or at least mentioning it. Uh, then let me just quote it. I have it right yeah. here. A person must be a being with his own point of view on things. The life plan, the choices, the sense of self must be attributable to him, as in some sense their point of origin. Origin. Here's the person. Here's the part that I want to uh, underscore. A person is a being who can be addressed, who can reply. Let's call this uh, a being. A being of this kind, a respondent. Mm -hmm. Now, so this idea, it seems to me it, it might be useful for your purposes to have the idea of a person as a respondent mm -hmm. for, for it conceptually uh, ties in with the idea of uh, them as an interlocutor and a person who might well be uh, silenced or, yeah. or unsilenced. And uh, so it brings in all of those uh, rich features. I don't know, that may constrain things in a way that's um, you don't want to be constrained. I mean, it looks like uh, dogs won't be respondents, and some people want dogs to oh, be right. persons. Right. But, yeah, but but I don't. But other than that, I mean, it looks as though, in any case, that you want an, a a concept of the person such that uh, um, persons can be de dehumanized, right? Yeah. Or, Whereas corporations, I, I would think, can't be, cannot be dehumanized. Mm -hmm. uh, so you've already got a, 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 a narrower conception when you think about the kinds of vices and 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 wrongs that you can commit. That's oh, so cool, cool, good, good, that, good, good. That, that's really helpful. That's just yeah. a suggestion. But yeah. I, my my question briefly um, connects with some others, the Matt Kings especially. Um, if if you think of the per, a person as that way as a, at least a potential respondent, um, then it's not clear how it ties in with the idea of a person as the what uh, results, as it were, um, what is given by the best interpretation, um, because it might be. I mean, at least on the face of it, the, the best interpretation view seems to allow for you uh, you might think the best interpretation is never to 
never to pay any attention to the what the other person says or you know to ignore them altogether <laughs> yeah, at, it, least, yeah. at least on the, the face of that might make sense uh, where uh, as, just in terms of best interpretation but once you bring in the idea of a response that seems to be off the table any anyway well, I, see, I see that that might help as well yeah yeah so somewhere behind my my green screen fake books I have my Charles Taylor that I'm trying to it's on my list that I had not mastered <laughs> but um, I I find it really helpful the, and especially the way that you used the the vice of de dehumanizing to draw out how it is that my diagnosis of that would overgeneralize if I'm lumping in animals or others as persons. They, they should be distinguished in some important way if, if I'm going to get that vice right. Yeah. 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 That's super helpful. Super, super helpful. Okay. Take thank care. you. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Next, I'm going to call on Juan Zhang. Hey, Juan. Can you? Hi, Juan. Hi, Gwen. Hi uh, Mark. Hey, good to see you. Can I can I turn on your video? Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, you should be able to turn yeah. on. Your video. I cannot see myself. You might have to switch on your video. Uh uh uh. Super. Yes. Hey. Hi, Gwen. Hi. Uh, Mark and have everybody. So, so this is a worry about the uh, the holistic and especially the narrative view. Um, so I'm thinking that uh, is it possible that when we are like um, taking this holistic or narrative view uh, or or interpretation, it's possible that some things are left 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 unattended, like contrast this view with the psychological view. Um, the psychological view will locate like the, the, the cause of the things right in the person's desires or beliefs or other like mental attitudes or things like that. Seems it has a definite location for 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 the like, for like for responsibilities and things. Um, but then like when we take this holistic view, I'm thinking it's possible when we tell a story of some of, of somebody as a person when we um, look at the shape of the life or the overall, or how the overall like uh, vision of the person is like, then it seems some some derivate der der derivations or some uh, some other like um, abnormal things they're not included not included in the story of this person can mm -hmm. be left out, and it can, and so this account can be too loose or too strict in explaining or in like um, defining what we are responsible for and we are not responsible for. Um, and so from, from here, I have a further worry about the, <laughs> about the holistic or narrative story itself. Um, it's, it's a question of mine that, uh, is it really true that we can really tell an authentic um, narrative story of our life? Is our story really, can, can our life really be understood as a story or a narrative? Um, I'm thinking that, uh, so um, we deal with a lot of contingencies in our life. And um, um, when we tell the story of ourselves, our life, usually we tell the story um, back forward lookingly. Like we look back in hindsight not in hindsight, but we look back and we try to like string the prose on and tell, mm -hmm. tell this like a whole holistic story. But then yeah. uh, it seems to me that uh, many things about our life, um, like they don't necessarily, don't, don't necessarily follow some reason or follow some plan. So mm -hmm. um, is it possible that when we are telling the story of our life, it, we actually distort the fact of what our life really is. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So, so uh, let me just try to address the first thing first. I think you, one of the, your first thought was that it's sort of too easy to exclude stuff that's atypical. 
and that we should be able to end up being responsible for atypical behavior mm -hmm. and not always have it ruled out because that's very unusual. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think that's a great worry and I, I can't adequately answer it here because I more has to be spelled out about how it works. But, but I think that if it's always excluded, I think it's really gonna rob us of too much agency. Mm -hmm. um, if everything that's atypical is something that is barred, um, I think that we're capable of doing atypical things. So a story about me, which I never do anything atypical, is the one that does bar rob me of too much agency. So I'm hopeful that with some refinement, the account can land in the right place. But I grant that that is one of the serious worries about refining it. Um, in the second part, you had this, this broader skepticism about the narrative, mm -hmm. and particularly that there's unplanned stuff, that a lot of it's backward looking. Mm -hmm. I think it's not just backward looking. I think that we tell narratives about our lives that are forward looking as well as backward looking. Oh, that's true. I, I, I might be, and I might, you know, if I'm in, in music school, you know, my story is that I'm on my way someplace. I'm on my way to being the flautist for the New York Philharmonic until I find out that I've got a back problem and can't sit practicing for as many hours a day as my neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out I'm not gonna cut it at music school. And then I go, and become a motivational speaker who tells stories about how I failed at Juilliard and that my career is based on having a story to tell about how I failed at Juilliard. And now I've got a new story that encompasses my old story. It's not the story I thought I was telling, but it's the story that I end up telling about myself later. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that we're always telling these stories. And there are a lot of philosophers who think that these stories are important. Um, uh, David Vellman uh, in Practical Reflection talks about somebody who's walking up Fifth Avenue and they forget where they're going and they stop. Because self-understanding, he says, is important. And later he comes to think that narrative is really important. And uh, Susan Bryson tells this really analogous story about how her life was going along and then it stopped because of something that happened to her that barred her from having a kind of under understanding, narrative understanding about where her life was going and mm -hmm. why. And, but many people take it to be the stories we tell about ourselves to constitute who we are. Mm -hmm. I think I think that's wrong. No, I think they're attempts to know who we are, mm -hmm. and um, and that's why we don't have. There's no question to ask about which storyteller is authoritative. Is it my earlier self telling the story, my later self that tells a different story? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, they, they are indeterminate in various ways. Maybe they're not done until our lives are over. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're still indeterminate after our lives are over. Maybe stuff that happens after we're dead can can tell us whether my life was a success or a failure. Mm -hmm. um, and so which of those stories about my life is the right one might be one that we can't fully know because it's not, there's no truth of the matter until later. Those are all things I'm very sympathetic to. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so I, yeah. So um, um, what, are the, what are the advantages of this story view versus the view that we have like plans and aims? Well, um, I think we do have plans and aims, but I think that some of our plans are not authentically ours in the same way that others are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I might be the unwilling addict and I might make a plan about how I'm gonna get that hit. You know, I might have to get some money first. I might have to, you know, uh, uh, go across town. Uh, I've got, you can have all this planning in the course of, of things that we might say are less than authentically ours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we are, um, we are sort of, I guess, at the at the official time, but maybe we can squeeze in at least one more question mark. I, I can, I can, yeah. can? yeah. Okay, maybe we can uh, do even more than one. So, um, but let's, let's at least go to the next one. So I'm gonna call in Kenny Eswaran. Kenny. Hi, Mark, thanks for this. Hey, thank you. Can I switch on your video? Mm -hmm. Awesome, okay, one moment. All right, there we are. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, so um, yeah, so I'm not sure I followed all the details here, but I think uh, this is a really interesting project uh, that actually has some uh, strange connections to things that I'm thinking about these days. But cool. uh, uh, one thing I'm wondering is, um, so Kevin Dorst has a recent project that uh, he's been working on uh, where he's, he's claiming that uh, some, uh, so he's analyzing the, uh, the current sort of political polarization 
and he's claiming that at least some of what uh, goes into the dehumanization of our political opponents is growing awareness of um, sort of biases that make people irrational. And so he says, now that we know terms like confirmation bias and uh, availability heuristic and whatever else it is, he yeah, said- we've got diagnoses, yeah. Yes, so we, we diagnose other people as uh, failing from these things. And uh, his project is to say that many of these, that, that these are actually not irrational. These are rational responses to our limited circumstances because he wants to undercut the use of these things as these sort of uh, uh, things that might in your uh, yeah. uh, count as uh, tools of dehumanization. And I'm just yeah. wondering how much do you see that as a related project to this? Uh, Very much. So uh, I didn't front it in this discussion, <laughs> but in the first paper that came out of this project, um, the person says things, I sort of start with ways that we uh, start to depersonalize people by having causal explanations mm -hmm. of them and drawing a comparison to Kant, mm -hmm. who, uh, you know, really characterizes our treatment of things as understanding them in terms of causal laws of nature, mm -hmm. understanding persons as understanding them as giving themselves their own laws. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that was kind of my way into this, is thinking about uh, that somehow we screen off seeing something as uh, something that really represents somebody as a person when we conceive of it in these causal terms. So I think it's not just that we believe it, the causal, because we can know that there's a causal story mm -hmm. about all of yeah. stuff. It's something about how we front that in our interpretation, or perhaps maybe when we understand somebody as a person, we're applying a model and our trick to uh, bracket stuff, to leave it out of the model, is that we have available an alternative causal interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, we leave that stuff out and the stuff that we leave into our interpretation of somebody as a person is the stuff that's left over. And um, so uh, I think that there's this exclusion that, that, uh, that Strassen talks about and that Langton talks a lot about in the studio and desolation paper that changed my world when I read it mm -hmm. that um, where when we think about things in these causal terms and I I think that this this thought I haven't I haven't read this work yet by Dorsch but that mm -hmm. when we apply these diagnoses of each other that facilitates the conflict because yeah. we off we it's only rare that we apply the diagnoses to, our, to ourselves yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, when as we get these diagnoses we apply them to other people and that makes it easier uh, to, uh, dis as we have more of these causal tools, that makes it easier for us to dismiss them. Now, whether right. that, now whether, whether it'll help that we see that these things are rational, I'm not sure. It, mm -hmm. it could help if we conceive of them in that way. Mm -hmm. But maybe learning that they are rational is not the same thing as, as thinking about them that way when we cognize other people. Right, and I suppose one difference might be that uh, he wants to see these things as either rational or not rational, and therefore either uh, appropriate for this use or inappropriate. And you might say that it's going to depend on what is the best story of this person, uh, whether or not any particular instance is included, and that there's no reason that these sorts of phenomena would have to have a single uniform uh, decision as to whether they're always in or always out. That, I, think, right? I think that's right. But I think that as we interpret other people, Mm -hmm. we're, we're kind of making this choice of what's in or what's out, but our cognitive tool for leaving it out is often that we can say where else, what else it attaches to. Yeah. So it's not you, it's this. Uh, yeah. And yeah. So, so I think that even if we're looking for the best interpretation, if having a different repertoire of tools for uh, uh, leaving it out uh, could make different interpretations available to us or incline us towards different ones. So I find the whole line of thought very, very tempting and congenial. All right, good. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Thanks. Um, okay, so, well, we have, a, we have still three questions left, Mark. I don't know how you're feeling. Can I take them? Can I take them? You wanna take them? Yeah, are the people, I don't know has to stay for them, but I, yeah, yeah. Yeah, people wanna ask, yeah. Yeah, and I realize people may need to go. Um, so, okay, next I'm gonna call on Wayne Fenske. I mean, can, uh, 
turn on the camera or whatever it is. Yeah. Okay, one moment. Okay, am I up? Or? Yep, you should yep. be able to turn your video on. Oh, sorry. Oh, I see. Yep. Okay, very quickly, I just want to say myself and I would imagine a number of other people have thought about what a good idea it would be to have a series like this during these COVID times, but you, Gwen, have actually done it, done so it. I think you should be applauded uh, for that. Uh, this is great, I think. Um, moving on to Mark, if I understand this correctly, I'm just wondering um, whether or not uh, it might be the case that it's simply indeterminate whether a desire, urge, propensity, whatever it is, is um, protagonist or predicament at any particular point in time in someone's life, because resolving that issue would be a matter of um, what they value most or most coherently over the course of their life. So future events are going to, to some degree, determine what the best interpretation is at an earlier point in time. And if that's so, then um, it's not quite that you're detecting facts about some of these issues because there just are no facts. It's indeterminate. Yeah, and I'm if, super... If, yeah, I'm if sorry that's to correct, If that's correct, what significance would that have to your overall project? So I, I think that's right. Um, I think that I'm both super sympathetic to it, and I think that taking seriously what I've said about the holism should lead us to go there. Not that you couldn't take different pieces of what I've said and like leave that out, but I think that that is the direction that it goes. Um, in a... Um, I've argued in another paper that this has like important consequences for thinking about paternalism and how we treat other people and whether interfering with them in different ways necessarily interferes with their autonomy. So what I think is that when people have really close relationships that allow them to help to shape somebody over time and to the extent that they have those relationships, that should give them confidence that there's room in the future to steer down a course where the story's a little bit different than it looks right now like it's gonna go. Um, and so this kind of indeterminacy, because there's more indeterminacy with children than with adults, um, and because not just biological parents or adoptive parents, but, but whoever it is that has close relationships with a child um, uh, has more opportunity to help shape that. I think that creates a lot of room for autonomy enabling responses uh, that explains how it is that paternalism can be appropriate. And I think the same thing applies with respect to long-term friends, uh, spouses. I think that there's room for people to help to shape each other. Uh, and of course, often people overextend this and interfere with each other in, way that, in inappropriate ways. But I think it, uh, like many kinds of wrongdoing, I think it can often come from the overextension of a good principle uh, that um, of, of, of knowing that you could be in a position to help to shape something and steer it along a particular path. And so in those cases, you know, there's the, the, the truth tracking part, but also uh, you might have some say in what the truth is and you can help to make it a certain way. Okay, great, thanks so much. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Awesome, thank you. Uh, okay, so I guess, I guess we'll do maybe two more questions, however many. All right, so uh, next I'm going to call on Corey Davia. Hi. Hey, Corey. Hi. Hi. Can I switch on your video? Sure. Great. I'll just be one second. There we go. Did that work? Yeah, you should be able to turn it on now. There you are. Hey, Corey. Oh. Um, so at like a big picture level of description, seem like the question you started out with was, uh, you know, there's a bunch of stuff going on in us, what, which of it is genuinely ours. Yeah. Um, and then later on in um, the like consequences or applications part of the talk, it seemed like sometimes you wanted to gloss that or maybe just a part of that as what we genuinely care about. 
uh, or what uh, we're genuinely oh. trying to say. Okay, good. And I, yeah, I want to hear a little more about the relation between those. I mean, so here's I didn't a reason. Want to, yeah, yeah. So go ahead. Uh, just here's a reason for thinking they can't be the same. I think there's stuff that's genuinely part of me that's bad, right? Like uh, have implicit biases, stuff like that. So um, can you just say more about how you're thinking about the genuine caring as like, how is that related to the bigger picture? So I don't think that just because you really have implicit biases, that means that the implicit biases are part of you as protagonist as opposed to part of the predicament that you like all of us are stuck with. I think that it's going to be a lot of question in different cases how to classify implicit biases. But I do think there's a difference between genuinely caring about something and it being part of you. The talk about genuinely caring was supposed to be a matter of whether the caring is genuinely part of you. So mm -hmm. there's stuff that we care about, but where that caring itself is one of the things that would be seen as a predicament. So for example, you know, my uh, when my mother-in-law visits, she makes sure that our extra uh, trash can liners are at the bottom of the trash can, but that they're also folded. So it's not just that. So she'll, when she changes it, she'll, she'll, we'll, I'll put the trash can liners down at the bottom so they're ready for the next one. But, but when she comes, she'll fold them. Now I think that she cares about that, but that that's like a hangup she should get over. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't accept, I don't accept that her, and she cares about it a lot because every time she's here, she does it. Um, but I'm not ready to accept that that's something that she genuinely cares about in the sense that I give up that caring about that as part of her story. Um, I think that that's like all kinds of cases of like being stuck on something that it's not really, you might feel like it's important. I'm going to ask you, is that important? You're like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, um, you know, trash liner boulder. Um, but I think that that could be wrong. So that's, that's the relationship is that it was just a special case of only being genuinely yours. And I see. And I think you could, it could be true that you genuinely care about something about yourself with or without that other thing about yourself being genuinely yours. Um, it could be the best story about you is one on which uh, you really care about this thing that's really you, or if you want to which you really care about this thing that isn't really you. And part of your story that's tragic is that you misunderstand yourself. And here you are, caring about trash can liners, caring about the fact that you care about trash can liners, um, uh, genuinely caring about the fact that you care about trash can liners, but not genuinely caring about trash can liners, you know, that you have a kind of misunderstanding of yourself. That, but it's a kind of genuine understanding, misunderstanding. Um, so I think it can go all those ways. Okay. So, I mean, maybe I just want to flag that I think this might be one place that's connected to the very early on question about moral responsibility. Because um, yeah. it might seem that what we want to count when we're thinking, is that something Corey really did? Um, is that something we can hold him responsible for? Um, that might include the sorts of things that, like, on reflection, I want to distance myself from or I don't genuinely care about, right? I, like you might think you're morally responsible for uh, throwing a fit about the trash can liners. <laughs> so, uh, so that's just, just something to think about. Well, yeah, um, but it could also be that that's something you should have managed about yourself. And one of the ways in which you could be responsible for aspects of your behavior that are less your own could be that it's a problem of self-management. So yeah. there's always cool. that piece, there's always that piece to control for too. So I have in the back of, sorry, I'll stop talking soon. I have in the back of my head some work by Kathleen Connolly that particularly wants to uh, push back against that type of strategy for explaining responsibility for implicit bias and put it in the genuinely something about you camp. Um, so sure. that was, uh, but yeah, I totally I don't agree. have any particular thoughts about implicit yeah. bias. I just, <laughs> everything else I think about I can describe cases where I think it is genuinely you and cases where it's not genuinely you. And so um, I think that's the thing that makes me think that'll be true for implicit bias as well. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, great. So we, it looks like we have two more questions. So next I'm gonna call on Stephen White. Hi, Stephen. Oh, oopsies, hang on, sorry. Somehow I clicked on the wrong 
name. Sorry about that. Uh, where'd he go? He gave up on us. There he is. Okay. Can I think? Yeah, can, can you see me? We cannot oh. yet, but I will. I'm working on that. Okay. Well, uh, I'll start. Thanks, Mark. Um, this I found this really interesting. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to just ask you to say a little bit more about um, a suggestion you made a couple times in the talk and in the Q and A about in the standards of interpretation that are relevant here being um, described in narrative terms. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the interpretation of what's attributable to you and what's not that makes for the best story might not be the interpretation that say um, paints your behavior in the best moral light, or the best rational light, right? I agree. So I'm just curious why um, why you're going the narrative route. I mean, what is the background I, uh, sort of idea about persons that leads you to that way of characterizing it rather than some other standard for interpretation? Um, I think it's, I think it's that the more I think about the distinction that matters, the more I feel like the protagonist predicament contrast is the most illuminating way of marking out that distinction. And, and those just feel like fundamentally narrative concepts. So, and then I've, I've found this to be, I mean, this sort of starts from a, a jumble of things and then over time I've been gradually trying to separate them and see what depends on what. Um, but I've also, you know, over the same time that I started with this project was working on the, basically the other project that started from not thinking of other work that I'd worked on that I've had over the last 20 years. Two of them started about the same time and they kind of merged. And the other one was more about uh, narrative self-understanding. And so I'm not sure that's an argument so much as a fact about an autobiographical fact. If you can do it without the narrative, then, um, then I'm happy for you. And I, indeed, the more that people could borrow pieces of this without having all of it, like that's what I'm trying to do is to figure out how to extract them. Um, uh, yeah, and that's totally unsatisfying. <laughs> I didn't really give you an answer. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, maybe I just say one thing about what sort of in the back of my mind here, I was curious about how much this pro your project here might dovetail or not with you know kind of common way that people have thought about persons in the history of philosophy as sort of terms and moral relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and and so capable of and this connects to your and responsibilities. Yeah. Uh, and but that way of thinking about it, I, I would be surprised if the best interpretation sort of tracked the best story as opposed to, you know, what's the most uh, say uh, morally or rationally salient kind of description of your behavior and what can be attributed to you versus your circumstances. I mean, um, so that that's just in the background. Uh, think about but yeah that, that, that's, that's really helpful I think that um, that does go back to uh, Gary's question and about right. what the scope is of who's gonna count as a person and in the first paper mm -hmm. that I wrote about this mm -hmm. it was full of the word contribution and the analogy between relationships and philosophy which are all about dialogue and I thought of I kept talking about agential contribution which is loaded and I think has this this discursive back and forth kind of character. And I, uh, that was very, that was a compelling way of thinking about it for me. Um, I still feel like the narrative stuff adds something to that, but it might also be that it, it can lead you in a different direction. And um, anything more about it. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Gwen, you muted yourself. 
sorry, my dog is snoring really loud, so I had to mute myself. Um, so, so there's at least one more question, uh, but also I want to say, Doug McLaughlin, I, you may have raised your hand the, the very second I was clicking on Steve's name. So if you still have a question, go ahead and raise your hand and, and you'll be the, the second question of our last two questions. If not, there's only one question. Um, B. Hughes. Sorry, there's no full name there, uh, but go ahead. You should be able to unmute yourself. Uh, yes, hello. Hi. Hi. Hey, so I don't have a, a camera on my computer, so I can't That's do right. that. Don't worry. But, uh, we'll roll with it. So I, I had a question about, uh, so you, you talk about defining people through their, like the narratives, right? Their stories, mm -hmm. basically. And, but what, well, thinking about it like temporally, definitely people have like stories definitely develop, become more defined as they get older. So how do you like mm -hmm. reconcile that with like during, you know, infancies and like near the end of a story where like, where can you say it ends and where that, that person ends and stuff like that. And so that's, so, that's so it's important for me that it's not their stories in the sense that it's the stories they tell about themselves. Mm -hmm. It's their stories in the sense that a story is about them. And so there's a lot of work that I find really insightful that appeals to stories we tell about ourselves and much of which claims that that's somehow constitutive. Uh, and there's some work that appeals to stories that groups tell uh, that talks about persons being socially constructed. Uh, and I'm really find a lot of the stuff that Hilda Lindemann has to say about this and some things that Susan Bryson has to say about it sort of deeply insightful and interesting. But I think that all of, both of those things sort of create this question about when is the story um, in a way that the, the story about us doesn't. Um, so I, I think that the account could be persistified in various ways to sort of like cut it off like the moment you die or something like that. I'm tempted not to. I'm tempted to allow the stuff that happens after you are dead could play a role in part of what makes something the best story. Um, uh, but um, there's no particular time in your life that we have to look. You know, the, the way you conceive of yourself or the story you tell about yourself or the story that others tell about you could shift or be rediscovered in really significant ways. Stuff that seems not that important, that happens early, that kind of gets left out of the story, can then be really important later because of ways that future events turn on it. You rekindle a relationship with somebody you met in kindergarten, and otherwise it wasn't that important. And, these kinds of things. So I, I want to say, you ask, you know, when, when does it stop? And the answer is all of it, <laughs> I think, goes into it. That's okay. the answer. That's the version I'm attracted to, although I, I think you could take it different ways. Okay, cool. But another thing that I see is that it's like, a, so does having a more defined story make you more of a person as compared to someone who doesn't? Or is it no, just... I don't think that's correct. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, whether your story, I mean, your self concept, the story you tell about yourself might be more defined or less. And that's just a matter of how opinionated you are about who you really are, I think. Okay. And okay. we've also talked in the questions about determinacy, about whether since the inputs to the interpretation go out into the future, it's really indeterminate at any given time, which of several different stories is the true one. And if I think that the determinacy is going to increase over time, just because you get older and are closer to the end of your life and have acted in ways that minimize risk of how things could turn out after your life. So somebody whose story is going to be more indeterminate might be somebody who's taking greater risks that will pay off after they die. So, you know, if I've invested heavily in, you know, produce in, uh, producing artwork or philosophy in wide variety of areas where I might or might not be influential. Um, each of those are things that could pay off. And so my story might be more indeterminate because it matters what happens after I die for whether those things are taken up and I made a contribution or whether my life was futile. And those would be different stories about me. Um, whereas somebody who takes fewer risks might have more, a more determinate story. And I don't think that makes them more of a person. Awesome. Thank you for the uh, talk. I really found it insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank every. So that was our that was our last question. Um, so that brings right. it.
Thank you so much. Thank Mark. you, Gwen. This is great. I really appreciate it. Everybody's applauding. Woo! <laughs> no, the, the, everybody's headed for dinner or lunch. <laughs> but uh, I, I thanks. I really appreciate this. This was really fun. I, I would not have put this together as a talk if not for Gwen's invitation. So. Oh well, it's awesome. Um, I'm so. This is a great way to start off the series. Um, so thank you, thank you all very much. So everyone, yeah. stay tuned yeah. for updates. So so will. That's right. This time we'll have this time next week, or rather two and a half hours ago. This time next week we'll have uh, Dave Sobel talking about hybrid theories of well-being. Nice. Um, Can't wait. Yeah, and so once again, feel free everyone to be in touch with your comments or suggestions, or head to the suggestion box. Okay, that's it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna end the meeting somehow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> here we go. Bye. Okay.